Hello, everybody. Um, สวัสดีท่านแขกผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านนะครับ Thank you for the opportunity that I have been given today to be here. Um, I'd like to share with you my passion about digital technology and education. It's a passion that is driven by the belief that because of the new technologies that we have today and the new understandings that we have about learning, something big will happen in school. Some big changes will happen soon. All right, and it's really driven uh, by the facts that we now know a lot about how humans learn today. Now, I believe that all of you have been through the school system, so it might be a little bit difficult about, you know, how much you know things can really change in a classroom. So, allow me to um, set the scene by showing a few examples of past changes that has happened throughout history. Another example: um, Did you know that we used to spray DDT directly onto children? <laughs> DDT is very popular in during World War II, and uh, the public was told that it's safe. You can inhale, you can eat DDT without causing any harm. So many schools in the U.S. actually use DDT to eliminate hair lice. And you can search the term DDT spraying on YouTube, and you'll find many shocking, you know, videos of what we used to do. So our better understanding about the harm of DDT actually led to, you know, a different perspective on DDT. And when we look back at what we used to do, you know, sometimes that's very uh, intriguing. So. Let's get back to schools. All right. So I believe we will be able to say similar things about what we do in schools today. You know, the way we educate our children, because new understanding in cognitive science, in brain science, and in development psychology has led to the understanding that people don't learn too well by peer instruction or by rote learning. But yet, that's what happens. That is what happening in most schools today. Right? The what. The where, the when, the how of learning today is very different with the technology that we have. You know, with Wikipedia, um, you know, with the cell phone, with you know, like the iPhone, iPads. But yet, school hasn't really changed the way they teach things um, since they began um, with the general public about a century ago. So that's really something that I think will make. Soon we will realize that schools aren't really creating the kinds of skills that we need for the 21st century. Okay, so that's that's the inspiration, right?、Um, that's what keeps me going. It's a little bit radical. It's a little bit out there for some people,、um, but it's why I do what I do. Okay, so what I'd like to share next is you know what I'm doing about it, right? And The thing that I find most fascinating when studying this is that a lot of what we learn in schools today are determined by what we can do with paper and pencil, the technology that we had a century ago. Now that we have technology, things can be so different, but we don't really think about it. Sometimes we teach things just because you know we've done that with previous generations. So, for example, do we really need to get kids to memorize all these facts about history now that all the information is available just a few clicks away? Or do we still have to teach algebra in the most boring ways? Now that we have the tools to make them come alive, and you can see why we learn all of this. Next is my responsibility, right? So I've tried to implement these ideas in schools for more than 10 years, and the things that I've the thing that I've found is that although schools sometimes accept my ideas and let me work with kids, I'm not usually part of the main thing that happens in school. You know, I'm just this thing that happens in an after-school program or maybe an extracurricular activity. If I cause trouble, they get rid of me, and I like to call this、um, phenomenon appendix phenomenon. Right? It's sort of the same thing.、Um, so I've discovered that it's really important to think about other factors that are important when you want an innovation to work in schools. And I've learned a lot about it when I was working on this、um, project. It's、uh, some of you may. Might have heard of it. It's called one laptop per child. We were trying、um, to、uh, give children、um, their own laptops, so we will have a whole class. Everyone has a laptop, and you know, see what happens. What are the opportunities, and what are the risks? So we did a relatively small,、um, you know, pilot study with 500 machines. Most of the schools、um, were in Chiang Mai, you know, near where I am, so I get to see a lot about what happens. And the thing that I've learned. From this experience, is that there are three basic building blocks that you need to have to get something to truly work in a school, right? So the materials, the tools, 
that's just one part. You need that. That's the innovation. But it's sometimes deceiving because when you put a technology into a school, um, in the beginning, they, used to, they, they are usually very excited and enthusiastic about this new toy they have. Like you put a laptop in front of a child, it goes like that, and they bring the laptop to school every day. They're excited to learn everything about it. But then this excitement, this energy level falls quickly after some weeks or some months. And you know, I, I like to call this behavior the Perks curve because I think it's a natural thing that happens and every one should understand this when, when you work with schools, is that it's natural for the interest, the energy level to fall. There's a great risk, if you don't do anything about it, that your project will fail. The whole thing will fail because it will just you know, go away. Only if the school can think about how to use the technology in a meaningful way, to integrate it into what you're really doing in schools, can the energy level come back up. And if you can manage that to happen, it usually stabilizes after a while. It might not reach the height of you know, when you first introduced it, but it, it is a great chance, there is a great chance that it will sustain. Two other things that are important. The institution factor. Right? So you know, the CEO has to be on board. Right? The headmaster, you know, if, if he or she doesn't agree on what you're doing, then that's mostly the end of story. So we have a great example about how one school, you know, one headmaster, believed in what we were doing with the laptop, and she, and she actually organized so that we had nine weeks to do projects, to learn with the laptops, without any traditional class. You know, and that's something that you don't typically see any schoolmaster would you know, want to do. Right? It re requires um, courage to do, and the belief that you know, what you're doing is right. The last part is the uh, socio-cultural factor. That's the teacher and, this, and the parents, especially the parents. And the parents are very worried about what happens with their children. So I'd like to summarize um, by showing you this map. It's a map that shows how much um, instruction a child at age 11 receives around the world. Um, not every country is in the data, but you can see that Thailand, my beloved Thailand, is number one in this category with almost eight hours of instruction per day. And it shows that the education system realizes that there's a problem, but the natural response is to do more of what they're already doing. Right? So you instruct more, you are more rigorous about testing. So it shows, it's, I think it's normal for a struggling system to re respond this way, but it also shows that innovation doesn't happen automatically. Right? There's a great risk of all of this opportunity will be missed. So it's a, responsibly, it's a responsible for all of us to create the awareness to make it actually happen. And I'm very proud to be part of this process. Thank you.